Don't work today. Bug <laughs> <laughs> <Hug> you out. <laughs> so I'm gonna go think of take one. <laughs> Bill and Ted talks so we're good. <laughs> 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 to tonight's meeting of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club. We're your hosts this evening. I'm Tobias and this is Will. Together we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. As attendees of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club, you are all now members provided you adhere to our philosophy. Ex curiositas scientia. We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual novice. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. This is our flag and our mascot, Franklin. The lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resonance of truths understood. It awakens and excites us and makes us hungry for more. Curiosity Club is made merrier by our fellow artisans, Fort George Brewery in Astoria, Oregon. And now, <laughs> let's give a warm Curiosity Club welcome to Scott Galatley of Gambling Colors. Yay! Well, first, I want to acknowledge and thank Hand Eye Supply for the uh, gracious invitation for me to come and speak tonight, um, as well as all of you, um, to take a, a, an hour out of your busy schedules to come. Uh, much appreciated. So uh, my name is Scott Galatly. I am um, first a, a proud native Oregonian and um, also a working um, artist in oil paint and uh, product manager for Gamblin Artist Colors uh, located here in, in Portland, Oregon. Um, I want to first kind of um, just uh, start with showing some examples um, of my own work and talk a little bit about my own um, process to, um, to landscape painting. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, Gamblin Artist Colors and what we do as a, as, as a color house here um, locally, and we also um, uh, supply our colors um, mostly in North America, but our, our colors are really sent all over the world. Um, <clears throat> but first to kind of discuss my own practice as a working artist. Um, I have a, a bachelor um, in fine arts from the University of Oregon in painting and drawing, and um, when I graduated from college, I went to work at Art Media here in Portland, and um, that was, <laughs> yep, great store. Um, and that was really kind of my um, immersion into the world of art materials, and um, really having experienced, um, you know, education from kind of the whys of art making, it was really great on, in the art material world to really dive into the nuts and bolts um, to, to figure out the how and with what. So I'm going to be pursuing um, those kind of questions and also talking about artists' relationship to color and how um, all of us as maybe creative individuals um, can have a personalized uh, response and a personalized voice with color. Uh, so first, just a few examples of my own work. Um, you know, I am practicing in um, you know, the mode of landscape painting that's often referred to as plein air painting. This is a French term um, literally translated into the, you know, the open air. Painting on site. Uh, this is my um, on site uh, easel, Prashad box as they call it that I use out in the field. And I will do um, small works, like you see framed around the stage here, on site, beginning and often finishing these paintings in the span of about two or three hours. Um, this is a, a small painting here, done just down at the banks of the Willamette River. Um, 
in the spring of last year. And you know, one of the things that I really like, and this is a point I'll be coming back to in a bit, is just the immediacy of plein air painting. Um, finishing it and um, you know, starting it and finishing it all in one painting session. Um, there's a great kind of spirit that happens with painting um, with the immediacy of responding to one's landscape. Um, capturing the atmospheric effects uh, and the kind of silverly, silvery quality of light that's so characteristic of uh, the Pacific Northwest is one of my main uh, kind of aesthetic or artistic approaches as a painter, but also capturing its um, rather kind of muted color scheme um, of our surrounding landscape. Oftentimes, uh, these small plein air paintings will translate into larger studio works. This piece is 24 inches square. And this larger piece is um, about 32 by 48. And this was done by you know, small little sketches done out in the field. I usually work from small paintings. Oftentimes, these paintings go through two or three different generations until I get to the larger studio work. Um, rarely do I work from photographs, except for those rare times when I do. <laughs> so, you know, in terms of the venues that, um, that I work in as an artist, you know, first it is out in the field. And um, this is out in, in wine country painting. Um, you know, I think it's always kind of a, a difficult issue of how do you price your work um, as an artist. And you certainly work up to different price points as you build your career as a painter. Uh, the painting that I happen to be work, working on here in this photograph, I traded for a case of Pinot. That wasn't bad. <laughs> I work primarily in my home studio. <clears throat> and then finally, in gallery settings. Um, this particular shot was taken in November of 2013 when I exhibited a group of paintings um, called the Sky Suite um, over at Brian Markey Fine Art over on Northeast Broadway. I've been fortunate enough to show with Brian for about 15 years now. And um, if you haven't been over there, I highly suggest checking it out. It's truly one of the best art viewing spaces in the city, in my opinion. <clears throat> so, you know, why landscape painting? Right now in 2015, um, you know, why pursue a uh, mode of painting that has existed for hundreds of years? And second, you know, how can I make it my own? I'm going to come back to that first question and deal primarily with that second question of how do I make painting my own in talking through um, an artist's relationship with color and talking about our, about our work at Gamblin Artist Colors. Uh, Gamblin Artist Colors was founded in 1980 by a painter, Robert Gamblin. And he actually started making paint in a small one-car garage in the Lads Edition neighborhood in the late 70s. He spent a year and a half only making white paint. And when he felt like he perfected the process of making paint, he moved on to an array of colors. Um, one of the things that really kind of sets us apart of a color house is that we are one of few companies left in the world that is just focused on producing artist oil colors. So this is really all we make. And so we are completely dedicated to oil painting and taking oil painting into the future by providing artists with materials that are true to historic working properties and respect the, the great tradition of oil paint but also taking it into the future by giving painters safer and more permanent materials. And when we talk about an oil color, you know, an oil color is um, 
you know, looking throughout its 600-year-old history, there's really nothing more that is as natural, as authentic, and enduring as oil painting. You know, we've talked about, um, you know, in art school, we talked a lot about how painting is dead, and then art is dead. And, you know, judging now by the market that we sell in, you know, there's, you know, more painters painting today than ever before in history. You know, we've um, endured the invention of photography. We've endured the um, abstract expressionists of the, er, of the mid 20th century. We've endured uh, the digital age. And, you know, oil painting is, you know, alive and well. When we look at the nature of oil paint, oil painting is really kind of a simple recipe. Um, the oil in oil paint comes from vegetable oil. It comes from um, the seed of the flax plant or linseed oil. What's unique about linseed oil as a drying oil is that it pulls in oxygen from the air and what we think of as wet oil paint turns into a dry painting and you know linseed oil is one of the best drying oils of all kind of natural vegetable oils in the world um, also you know that humble plant the flax plant has really been kind of the heart and soul of oil painting throughout its 600 year old history it gives us the, um, the oil that we bind our pigments with in paint making, but um, as this lower right hand picture shows out, that from the stalks of the flax plant, it gives us the linen that most artists paint on. So in the history of painting, it's been a very important uh, plant. Uh, when we look at the production of flax. Um, also what's somewhat interesting is in the height of um, the Northern Renaissance in the 14th and 15th centuries, the main capital of the flax growing region um, in Northern Europe at the time was in um, Flanders. And Flanders shares a similar latitude of the, of, um, the Dakotas, Eastern Montana, parts of Minnesota, uh, which is really the finest flax growing region in North America and the source uh, for gambling linseed oil. So <clears throat> that plant has been incredibly important for us and it really kind of um, embodies that natural quality of oil paint. And as this shows, we look through some of the iconic images of oil painting through the earliest examples of Van Eyck, of Rembrandt, Turner, Sargent, and then into the modern era with Claude Monet and the Impressionists, Picasso, O'Keeffe, Rothko, the contemporary Gerhard Richter. Oil paint has endured but also continued to evolve throughout this time. And artists' relationship with color and the color that's used in oil painting has really um, evolved and grown right along with oil painting. Uh, today, we are arguably living at one of the most colorful times to be in a creative field. Whether it's oil painting and artistic pursuits, whether it's design, um, you know, clothing and fashion, we are basically living in kind of the peak of um, our access to color. You know, so what do we do with this as artists? You know, we as um, artists have basically the most choices than at any other time in the history of painting. <clears throat> When we look at color, and we think about color from a purely um, theoretical point of view, we often put color into um, a model called color space. 
Um, this top image here is taken from a great presentation that exists on the Gamblin website called Navigating Color Space. And it really kind of breaks down the um, three main characteristics of color which are outlined below. We have value, which gives us the, the core of color space from the darkest dark or black mid, moving through that mid-tone of grays to the brightest white. Um, basically the, the inherent lightness or darkness of color. If you think of a black and white photograph or a charcoal drawing or pencil drawing, everything that the artist is trying to convey just exists through changes in value from lightest to darkest. It's the one characteristic of color that gives us, as viewers, the most visual information. And then we have the hue or color family that the artist um, is working in for any particular color. Um, it's known that this, the human eye can see about seven million colors. And all of those fit into one of the six hue categories yellow, orange, red, violet, blue, and green. And then we have chroma or color intensity. Um, those colors that are really intense um, are around the perimeter of the color wheel. And as they move into that neutral core of color space, they become more and more muted. So often when I'm teaching beginning painters, um, either working from a still life or the figure or the landscape, and we're observing color, we're thinking about color in our mind's eye, I'm asking them, you know, how light or how dark is that color? What is that color hue? What hue family does that color live in? And then finally, what's that color's intensity or chroma? You know, color mixing is really um, when all three of these considerations and characteristics are taken into um, account simultaneously. So in terms of thinking about you know, building a palette of colors, you know, I could give any number of recommendations to painters based on the theory. You know, how much color space can you access with a simple three color primary system of, color, of pigments, how color space and color mixing possibilities can be expanded to a 12 color or spectral palette of colors. But my approach is that this is all based on you know, color theory and what you do with it is really where the art comes in and building that personalized response to color. Which brings us to um, the color chart made available by Gamblin Artist Colors. Um, we make 98 different tubed colors um, in our artist grade line. Um, about Two-thirds of these colors are single pigment colors, which are just one pigment um, used in the, in the manufacturing of, of these colors. Other colors, um, such as uh, cadmium green, um, are aptly named Portland grays. Um, are mixtures of two or more pigments to get to those unique positions in color space. Um, but when we look at the gambling color chart, it really kind of um, is intended to marry all of these colors that are available to artists to link what's available with their own artistic intentions. And this really kind of talks about how artists can make you know, painting their own. There's a number of ways in which we can develop a, a voice as artists. One is through subject matter, one is through you know, certain technique or paint handling, but an often overlooked quality of how to make painting our own is how do we as artists 
um, connect with a palette of colors and a color sensibility that is unique to us. <clears throat> One of the main um, <clears throat> breakdowns and organizations of the color chart is the separation between um, mineral or inorganic pigments on the left side and modern organic pigments on the other side. With the mineral inorganic pigments, these are basically made from um, metals, whether they're naturally occurring iron oxides down at the bottom of the mineral side, or they're made by fusing metals together at incredibly high heats like cadmiums, cobalts, chromiums. These all exist on the mineral side of the color chart. Modern organics, however, um, all have their foundation in modern organic chemistry. They all contain carbon, and they have more tongue twisting of color names like quinacridone, dioxazine, thalocyanine, and they behave much differently than their, their inorganic counterparts. One of the analogies I use in talking about a large color um, chart like this with all of these color chips is, you know, if we took a picture of about 100 people all gathered at a family reunion, you might see some people that look very much like each other, but they have very different personalities. Um, that's a good analogy to some of the um, differences between um, mineral and modern colors. You know, such as um, these two colors, uh, cadmium red medium and naphthol red. Um, they are very similar out of the tube, um, but they have very different personalities in their tints when they're mixed with white. The cadmium red grays down significantly, which is one characteristic of all of the inorganic pigments is this very natural quality in which they mix with other colors or gray down in their tints. Excellent for producing the effects of natural light and the colors of the natural world. Whereas those modern organics retain a high degree of intensity or chroma um, when they're mixed with other colors or mixed with white. <clears throat> so again, linking it back to artistic intention and artists creating their own um, you know, color voice. Um, the other kind of split that we have or organization of the color chart is this separation in the classical palette down at the bottom of the inorganic side, the impressionist palette up at the top, and then the 20th century color palette on the right. So the three main eras of pigment history as we've moved from the, the you know, classical renaissance of oil painting through uh, the 20, 20th into the 20th first century. And when we look at those colors, um, from the Renaissance painting, such as uh, Andrea del Sarto, it's a very limited palette of colors. And most of those colors exist closer to that neutral core of the color wheel. Then we move into Impressionists, such as Paul Cezanne, where they had their interest in pure color and they had the pigments and the colors to pursue those interests, most of these inorganic pigments coming out of the furnaces of the Industrial Revolution of the mid-19th century. And then with the 20th century palette, with their in ability to retain intensity in their tints and their mixtures yields you know, paintings of very high key, high chrome, such as the work of, of Wolf Kahn. So 
I'm going to talk a little bit about just the personalized palette and those kind of thoughts that I went through in creating a personalized palette for my own artistic intentions. <clears throat> um, starting with um, a cool muted yellow called nickel titanate yellow. You know, like most inorganic pigments, these are made by fusing metals together at incredibly high heats. Um, cadmiums, cobalts, chromiums, they're developed at thousands of degrees and have great stability and light fastness, um, which refers to the pigment's inability to fade over time in response to the light that hits it. That's a really important concern when we, as artists, have the expectation that our work will last for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, nickel titanate yellow um, was for an inorganic pigment was a bit of a latecomer, um, having been developed in the mid 20th century. Indian yellow, I think, is one of the best stories of um, pigment history. And it was, came into fashion at the early part of the 19th century um, when a lot of British um, uh, citizens took up you know, painting and specifically watercolor painting as a pastime. Um, this was a very popular um, watercolor watercolor at the time, one that Turner used in creating his very luminous um, atmospheric skies. Um, Indian yellow came, of course, you know, India being a, a, a British colony at the time, was um, actually made by force feeding cows in India mango leaves, collecting their urine, letting it dry out, and the resulting sediment was ground into a pigment and thus became Indian yellow. Fortunately, we don't make it like that anymore. Uh, contemporary versions of Indian yellow are a, a modern organic pigment, uh, with much greater stability and um, more humanely produced. Uh, cadmium orange, um, like the range of cadmium yellows, oranges, and reds uh, was a product of you know, the Industrial Revolution of the mid-19th century. Uh, very opaque, very bright in its mass tone, and um, it quickly made um, colors based on um, lead and tin more obsolete in the artist's palette. Um, so painters like um, you know, late impressionists um, were the, the early adopters of cadmium pigments and really enjoyed their height in the early um, to mid uh, 20th century. Uh, works by uh, Kandinsky um, as well as into the abstract expressionists. Um, cadmium colors today are still very popular for their um, brightness, their opacity, and their mixing qualities. Alizarin permanent as being a cool, deep, transparent uh, red, Eliz replaces um, a color that is very popular called alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson was one of the earliest examples of um, modern organic pigments, having been developed in the late 19th century. But alizarin crimson, which is still available today, we still make a version of alizarin crimson at Gamble, has one of the lowest light fastness ratings of any pigment available. So it has a greater tendency to fade over time. What we've done is developed a alizarin permanent with um, more permanent pigments to replicate the, um, the color out of the tube, the unique undertone or transparency, as well as the mixing qualities of the alizarin crimson. <clears throat> 
Um, ultramarine blue is also one of those great kind of storied pigments throughout art history. Um, its name came from the Italian ultramarino, which literally meant beyond the seas. Traditional ultramarine blue was um, made by an impurity found in the stone of lapis lazuli, which was crushed and um, ground into oil to produce a really luminous reddish blue uh, color. Um, it was, at the time, the most expensive pigment on the artist's palette. I have a personal theory. I'd have to do the research to see if it actually holds water, but my personal theory is that any time you move further away from either Venice, which was the main point of import from the east, um, lapis was primarily came out of um, what is modern day Afghanistan, or Rome with the Vatican floating the bill. Any time you moved farther away from these two centers in Italy, the least you saw um, ultramarine blue used as a pigment in painting. Um, so if you think about some of the religious icon work at the time, um, those blue cloaks that the Madonna um, wore in religious icon painting, um, you would not you know, waste a very expensive pigment on a lesser, um, lesser individual in the painting. Uh, you reserved that for the most important person. Um, it became synthesized um, in the early 19th century and at that time it was really shifted from the most expensive pigment on the artist's palette to one of the most affordable and most widely available, which is still used today as ultramarine blue. So that is a warmer or reddish blue. Moving into the cooler blues, uh, we've got a pigment called manganese blue hue. And in color making, whenever there's that word hue attached to a color, it basically uh, communicates that there is a substitution of pigments that has occurred um, compared to how that color was originally made. One of the things that's important for us um, as artists to appreciate is that, you know, all of the artists that we, are, all of those pigments that we use are available to us because they're used on a much wider application through maybe the cosmetics industry, the um, commercial coatings industry, um, automotive industries, much broader uses of pigments. Um, in the late 80s, traditional manganese blue became um, obsolete. And due to its you know, high costs, um, its toxicity in making the pigment, but also its very low tinting strength. Modern organic pigments basically made that uh, manganese pigment obsolete. So we, um, because it was such an important color in color space, um, Gamblin uh, reformulated a manganese blue hue to replicate those qualities. <clears throat> and then finally, we've got titanium zinc white. Um, white is quite possibly the most important color in the artist's palette because we you know, use so much of it. And so, so much of our painting experience is dictated how the white um, feels to us under the brush or the palette knife. Um, before the 20th century, the main white that was used in oil painting was um, lead white, also known as flake white. Um, but due to the toxicity of lead white, um, most of artists have switched over to titanium due to its stronger opacity and tinting strength. Uh, the titanium zinc white kind of marries the opacity of titanium white with the more clean mixing qualities of zinc white. So this is kind of where I've stumbled upon as a personalized palette of colors. Um, as we move 
around the color wheel with the nickel titanate yellow, Indian yellow, cadmium orange, alizarin permanent, ultramarine blue, manganese blue hue. I'm basically moving from a mineral to modern color with every step around the color wheel. Um, and essentially what I'm doing is creating my own kind of personalized color space in my work. This is basically the access and limitations that I can get to with this mixing palette. To me, what's important for artists or any creative professionals is to kind of balance out the theory of color mixing with our own aesthetic responses to color. And it's really when we create that marriage of the theory and the aesthetics do we land on you know, us developing our own kind of color voice. <clears throat> so I'm going to come back to this issue of why landscape painting. Um, to me, there is you know, nothing more kind of natural than being in awe of you know, our surroundings. I think it's a great part of the human experience is to just be in awe of the natural beauty that surrounds us. Um, especially you know, being in a part of the country that is so rich and diverse in, in natural beauty. So I think part of that aspects of being a landscape painter is just the natural response to one's surroundings. To me, landscape painting is a very authentic experience. I go out in the field, um, being a um, you know, busy professional with gambling, um, as a father, as a working artist, I have very small windows in which I can go out and um, work in the field uh, to work from life. And to me, that really kind of um, creates a certain sense of authenticity to the act of plein air painting. It's kind of like fishing. You know, sometimes good paintings are biting, sometimes they're not. And if it works, it's great. These paintings can take on a life. If not, I give it the old solvent bath and pretend it never happened. <laughs> and then finally, landscape painting has endured. Uh, artists have worked from life out in the field, um, creating sketches to bring back into their studios, um, to produce large-scale, dramatic landscapes. Um, before the invention of photography, this was our main mode of communication to um, showing others what other areas and other lands looked like. Landscape painting has endured and evolved through the invention of photography. It's taken in all of the um, influences of action painting, field painting, um, of the abstract expressionists in the early, in the mid 20th century, and it still endures today. Uh, plein air painting and landscape painting is incredibly popular. Um, to me, it's that perfect marriage of um, enjoying the act of painting, um, making a, an art form that is um, widely appreciated, but also marries the, those artistic pursuits with a love of nature. And to me, landscape painting really marries and echoes those key characteristics of oil painting themselves, being natural, authentic, and enduring. So just in closing, I would, you know, whatever your artistic pursuits, I would, you know, think about finding your own color voice and making color your own in your work, 
whether that's through digital media, whether it's through painting, um, or any other artistic form where color is put into use. And finally, thank you. Um, from me as an artist and also from Gamblin Artist Colors. And I'm supposed to open this up for any questions. Yes. Right, right. Um, well, you know, actually one of the things I was going to do here, um, and it gives me a good response, um, good question to do this, is to demonstrate how oil paint was made by, by hand. Um, generally at the time, until the early 19th century, um, artists made their own paint or they had a studio assistant or apprentice making paint for them. Um, and, you know, artists have always worked within the confines of the materials that they made available to them. And, you know, as you point out, depending on where they lived, um, how rich their patrons were, really influenced what they had available to them. Again, if the the Vatican was floating the bill, you could probably afford that lapis to put into your fresco or oil painting. Um, so, <clears throat> speaking of the lapis, I've got two jars here. One is of contemporary ultramarine blue, dry pigment. And the other is just pure refined linseed oil, pressed from the flax plant. <clears throat> this is a beautiful blue powder. It's a, um, chemically it's a compound of aluminum and sulfur. So the first step is basically mixing that powder into the fluid linseed oil to form a dense paste with a palette knife. Would it, would, it be, would it be good for people to come up and... That'd be great if it doesn't <laughs> affect the, the AV. I have a question. Yeah. Even though you have, you know, yeah, the paint at your disposal. How often do you actually make your own paint? Um, only when I am demonstrating the process. <laughs> Are you I, again, my time is rather limited, and I would rather spend my time painting than making my own paint. Um, the other aspect, too, and this really directly relates back to this great question, was that making paint by hand, I can only put so much pressure on that pigment and oil mixture. So the second step is taking a glass or a stone molar with a flat bottom, which basically
coats all of those pigments with the linseed oil binder. So do you sell the, the powders also though? We do. So, so people can do this or they can buy the Absolutely. Can, can the oil be reconstituted anywhere or once it dries, is it dry? It's dry. It's dry. <laughs> and that's a great question too. And that is one reason that oil paints, you know, and oil paintings can be restored in the manner that they can, is that they dry to a very hard, durable finish. And that's one reason that they can be cleaned and really kept in the world um, for centuries. So this is a really kind of beautiful, luminous mixture of that ultramarine blue and pigment and oil. But I can tell you that the machinery that we have with the, um, the mixers, the dispersers, which replicates what I did with the palette knife, the three-roll mill, which replicates what I did with the molar, packs a lot more pigment into that linseed oil binder than I could ever do by hand. So um, beyond just the, the time aspect of it, um, getting color at its maximum and the, and the consistency from tube after tube, I would much rather leave it to the professionals. <laughs> So when you say maximum, it's like basically saturating that oil with the maximum amount of color to let it go. Exactly, okay. exactly. And, you know, we try to put as much color or pigment into that binder as possible, which um, dictates the color strength in the painting. Um, and we try to do it at a consistency that feels great right out of the tube. Uh, that's thick enough to hold a really nice crisp impasto, but soft enough that um, it maintains its flexibility and its adhesion throughout um, you know, the, the test of time. Um, but you know, a painting, painting in general, you know, I'd almost argue that it shouldn't be considered a two-dimensional art form. You know, oil paint has, you know, body to it, and you see brush strokes, and it has depth and luminosity to it, and it responds to the light that hits that painting in a really beautiful way. You know, it's more appropriate to call, call it kind of, you know, low relief in, in stone and oil um, than just <laughs> a two-dimensional <laughs> art that. form, you know? Great question. Yeah, Tobias. Is there anything that you um, lament about um, colors that are no longer available um, and like where modern colors might fall short? Um, that's a good question. I can... Most colors that are no longer available are no longer available for good reason. <laughs> um, you know, if we look at, you know, verdigris or green from Greece, as the translation means, it was basically oxidized copper plates that turned green, scraped as a pigment, and worked into um, oil paintings. Um, verdigris did not play well with others, and you had to isolate it to prevent it from um, turning black. Um, we talked about the process where, you know, Indian cows were basically made as the processing unit to make <laughs> Indian yellow. Um, most pigments that have been made obsolete have been made obsolete due to their poor aging properties, their toxicity, or just a general availability. Um, Personally, no, I don't miss any of them. <laughs> yeah? I've been told that zinc white and 200% is 
percentage causes problems? What's your take on that? Uh, that's correct. So um, zinc white is um, beautifully kind of transparent as a color. It's great for glazing, but in too high a percentages, it's um, very brittle. Um, it also is a very low tinting strength white, which means that you have to use more of it to influence the other colors that you're mixing with, which compounds the problem of its brittleness. So we recommend either keeping zinc white just used for glazing, which where there's generally a lot more oil or fat content added to those top layers of the painting, which then mitigates its brittleness. So yes. You spoke about the uh, 19th century industrial practices generating a whole new like, world of color. Right. right. So was there a wild west of artists going out to furnaces trying to find new colors, or were they following the paint makers, the industrial paint makers, or the makeup people? Whoever was, who was the person at the forefront of discovering this new color? Well, you know, I think that that's a great question. There's so much changed in the beginning to the um, middle of the 19th century. It was really a perfect storm of a number of things. First, in, eight, in 1841, you had the invention of the metal collapsible tube of paint. And before then, artists would hand make their colors and store it in pig bladders. Um, you had industrialized color makers appear on the scene um, for the first time. Um, They're making it obviously primarily for industry. Well, actually, you had artist makers, really? at, you know, in Britain for the first time. Um, a lot of painters took up painting as a pastime. And because of that, you had, um, you know, again, the marriage of the technology with the machinery available in the Industrial Revolution, the invention of the collapsible tube, and you had um, these color makers come on the scene for the first time. It was um, really the, the foundation of our, in our industry as color makers. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, it also was a shift in time when painters um, didn't have color specifically made just for themselves. These colorants like cadmiums, cobalts, chromiums, for the first time people had to paint the sides of rail cars, um, you know, paint on much larger industrial uses. And, you know, instead of color made specifically for artists, you had early adopters working these pigments back into, you know, their paintings and their painting process. So I think that those artists of the, the Wild West were really the Impressionists. You know, you think about Impressionism and what sparked that, you had a response to the invention of photography that really changed painting's role in society. It wasn't about reporting anymore. You had the, the camera to do that. So you had the um, kind of backlash against a lot of the traditional Parisian salons at the time, very classically trained artists. And you had this group of impressionists that took a more internal response to the world around them. and adopting these new pigments and colorants that were first available to them at the time. So absolutely. Yeah? How many paint houses are there that make their own paint that don't just repackage somebody else's? Um, in the United States, I would say there are about one, two, Five. Less than ten. That's pretty small. It's very small. In the in the 
in Europe, I would say there's most countries in Europe have a strong national brand. England has a couple. Uh, Germany, Italy, um, Spain all have strong national brands. But I would say worldwide there's <clears throat> less than you'd think and maybe more than there needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So you mentioned toxicity as a factor for colors getting phased out. Is there any kind of interesting stories behind, like, oh, that kills, like, arsenic kills people or something like that? Um, arsenic was a great example. Um, arsenic was actually a foundation for emerald green, which was used by the Impressionists. Better used as a rat poison in Paris at the end of the 19th century. And one theory is that it was a component of the wallpaper in the room um, that Napoleon spent his exiled years towards the end of his life. So not only was it harmful to artists, but it was just um, a means to dispose of um, you know, world dictators at the time. <laughs> Did, was there any, like, any famous artists that died from their craft in that way? Um, you have, you know, all sorts of theories of what drove Van Gogh um, a bit batty in his life. You had um, um, <clears throat> theories and studies based on um, Renaissance painters. Uh, I believe Caravaggio was one of them. Um, I know um, even Beethoven that, um, you know, of lead poisoning. So, yeah, there's, there's stories out there, absolutely. Yeah? Where, now you see nine paintings, but neon colors. Where do those fit in the colors? <laughs> ah, way out in the perimeter. Um, so, um, neon colors, um, as a colorant, unfortunately, they're not very stable. So as an artist colorant, um, they are not widely used because those qualities that makes them neon um, basically giving back more light than they, ref than they pull in. Um, those qualities are the qualities that diminish over time as an artist colorant. Um, so there are some um, neon colors in the acrylics realm, but even they come up with the caveat of um, their, their lower stability. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about like when you go to an art museum as an expert in color as a material and you look at like a Rothko that we know his reds were fugitive, we know he's working for any number of the painters throughout history where we know that their materials have these flaws. Are you able to look at it and know what's meant to be there? Yes and no. Um, when I go into an art museum, I try generally unsuccessfully to turn all of this off <laughs> and just enjoy the experience. Um, Having said that, I am the guy that gets this close up to the paintings to see texture and the way these, these uh, materials have aged. Um, one of the other aspects of what we do at Gamblin is that we um, make a small line of conservation colors that are just used on the in-painting of um, masterworks around the world, mostly in Europe. Um, and you know the, the field of conservation science is amazing at keeping these intact in a beautiful state, but also keeping all of that work as invisible as possible. Um, so yes, there are examples that I've seen where I've seen maybe the poor aging of a painting medium that Turner used, and I can readily identify the effects. I can um, 
maybe see a very gaunt, kind of lifeless face and know that the reds have, um, have disappeared from that based on the artist's original tension. Other artists' um, work that have been kept up and restored um, look absolutely beautiful. So that's another aspect to appreciate as well. So, you know, I'm a, a big fan of painting in all of its forms. So first and foremost, I just try to take it in and enjoy. Yeah. The Dion color question reminded me that I at least didn't hear you refer to the radiant color section on the, the gamble and color chart. Yes, um, yes. In short, they're basically high key tints of our modern organic colors. They were developed out of um, Robert's relationship with the painter Wolf Kahn, whose um, painting I showed, um, talking about that 20th century color space. So um, they're basically, you know, really high key intense colors. Um, at all of the same value coming out of the tube. Yeah. yeah. Is the founder of the company still around and does he paint? Uh, he is still around. Um, he does paint his studios right across the street from the factory. And he spends about a third of his time in the studio, a third of his time at the factory, and a third of his time in the garden. Well, uh, again, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, it's been a real honor to be asked and um, be happy to answer any more questions one-on-one um, -on -one after this over a beer. Yeah, please feel free to come up and ask any further questions that you have. Uh, we return June 2nd with Curiosity Club alumni Joshua Lifton of Crowd Supply and Stenosaurus with his talk, The Anarchist Organic Cookbook for Product Development. The way products are designed, manufactured, paid for, and delivered is rapidly changing, driven by the same force at play in the slow food, sharing economy, and open source software movements. See what happens when transparency becomes a core tenet of product development. I'll be talking, or he'll be talking about Crowd Supply, a company he co-founded to explore these ideas by helping people create products in a new way. He'll give a broad overview of Crowd Supply and then dive into several case studies of products created through Crowd Supply. This is a story about building things the way they should be built. That should be good. And let's have another round of applause. <laughs> questions. Oh, good. good. Um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't made the leap yet, but I should be. Yeah. <laughs>